Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Carolyn Brandon. I'm a senior fellow for industry and innovation at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Today, um, we have, I think, a very exciting and interesting, as well as a highly technical uh, agenda for all of you. We are going to sprinkle some policy nuggets uh, here and there, including an 11 a.m. panel and a lunch keynote. Wanted to give you two seconds on the Georgetown Center. We are the Center for Business and Public Policy housed within the Georgetown School for Business. We focus on policy and business issues, specifically at the intersection where regulation and business are meeting. And more and more, especially for our space in the what I would call the wireless sector, spectrum policy is something that more and more people within the Beltway here in Washington, D.C. are focusing on. So in partnership with Peter Rasavi and the Wireless Technology Association, we are very proud to bring you the second annual event where we bring together both technologists as well as policy experts, as well as the business folks involved in this ecosystem that we call wireless broadband. Because wireless broadband is so integrally entwined with tech policy and with future economic growth in the digital economy, we thought today's discussion was of particular relevance, especially given the actions that the Federal Communications Commission and NTIA within the Department of Commerce are taking with respect to figuring out how in the United States to make more spectrum available to wireless broadband providers and to stay ahead of a capacity constraint that many, many such as Peter, have predicted is not in the too distant future. But let us not be remiss, these issues are not just domestic. Facing the issue of spectrum allocation and licensing and how to stay globally competitive is an issue that is shared by countries around the world. I will let Peter introduce our friends from Japan, some of whom who came overseas to join us today. They will also share their perspective on spectrum issues in their home country and help explain to this audience why the issues we're talking about today, again, are not just relevant here domestically, but also are relevant to global competitiveness, both of the, of the United States and countries around the world. So a few housekeeping details before I turn it over to Peter to do some additional introductions. Our hashtag for today's conversation is displayed right here. It's hashtag WTA tech policy. So for those of you who are encouraged, interested, excited by, or maybe just annoyed by anything that is said today, please get on your Twitter feed and shout it out to the world. We think this is an important conversation. We want to make sure that others who are not able to join us today in the room are able to also participate. We are going to uh, have a keynote presentation. We are then going to go into a policy discussion. Then we're going to march right into a conversation with some investor analysts who will give us that perspective on the sector. Then we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. Lunch will be outside in the atrium, which is where you all came in. After lunch, we'll then resume in here for the afternoon sessions. So without further ado, let me introduce Peter Rasavi, who is the founder and head of Rasavi Research, as well as founder of the Wireless Technology Association, who is one of our partners for today's event. Peter. Thanks, Carolyn. When I started consulting, specializing in wireless technology 20 years ago, the state of the art was sell your digital packet data. We were very excited um, at the time. Uh, but CDPD was, compared to LTE today, was 1,000 times slower and 10,000 times more expensive to use. So we have come a long way since then. It was 10 cents per kilobyte, uh, which equates to $100,000 per gigabyte, um, and compared that to $10 a gigabyte for typical usage-based uh, planning. Back then, we couldn't, nobody knew what wireless data was. We couldn't get anybody to use it, right, except for some dispatch companies, um, some innovative taxi firms, and so forth. So really, we have come a long way in those 20 years, but we're only in early days. I believe that we're just now at the dawn of the mobile broadband era. And the purpose of this workshop is to explore the potential of this technology and market area. Um, what is going to be possible 
in the next 10 years. To what extent can wireless broadband be a substitute for wireline broadband? So we're going to explore this topic in both technology and policy perspectives. Uh, the Wireless Technology Association was incorporated as the Portable Computer and Communications Association about 20 years ago. Um, I've been involved with the organization since 1996. Actually, I was not the founder, um, but, <laughs> but uh, and, and some members here have been with the organization for almost 20 years. Um, we hold workshops to analyze what we consider the most important developments in the wireless industry. Um, and often we have uh, fairly technical uh, topics presented. So we do actually, I have to uh, mention just our confidentiality or non-confidentiality requirement since it's part of our intellectual property rights policy. And it states that no contribution that is subject to any requirement of confidentiality or any restriction on its dissemination must be considered in any of our workshops. And there must not be any assumption of confidentiality uh, with respect to any contribution. So that's also mentioned at the bottom of our agenda page. And oh, by the way, we do have a hard copy of the agenda uh, if you didn't get one. Um, and that'll help you keep track of what's going on during the day. I uh, also need to mention uh, that we are now in what is called the quiet period for FCC Spectrum Auction 97, also known as the AWS 3 auction, which is now in effect. During the quiet period, auction applicants are required to avoid discussions of bids, bidding strategy, post-auction market structure, and other auction applicants, um, or with other auction applicants. Please avoid asking questions or raising issues about these topics. Please respect um, your colleagues' judgment if they determine they are unable to participate in certain discussion due to the FCC's anti-collusion rule. So that really impacts very near-term um, spectrum policy. Our workshop will, most of the items we'll be discussing will be longer term than that. So I don't think that'll be an issue, but it's possible that at times one or two panelists might say that I just cannot comment on that particular item. All right, uh, some other logistical items for the day. We are recording the event. It is not being streamed, uh, but we will be making uh, access to the videos afterwards. I'll be sending out an email to everybody that participated today, providing you access to the presentations that are given and providing links uh, to the video. Uh, as for myself, I'll just briefly mention I've been involved with the Wireless Technology Association since 1996. I've been the executive director since 2000. Um, in my, uh, when I'm not doing the Wireless Technology Association, I am a consultant in wireless technology. In over 20 years, I've worked for over 100 different organizations. Our next workshop after this one will be in April of 2015 in Atlanta. And it will be on the extremely relevant topic of connectivity models and communications protocols for Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is not going to be necessarily a TCP IP world where we use the same interfaces and applications and communications approaches as we do for human communications, such as web browsing, email, um, and watching video. We're going to have to invent a whole new way for machines to communicate if we're going to do it uh, extremely efficiently with low energy, uh, enabling huge battery life for certain classes of devices uh, to support communications that ranges from extremely low data rates to extremely high data rates. So the purpose of the workshop is to explore that topic. I'm pleased today that the Mobile Computing Promotion Consortium, MCPC of Japan, is joining us. The Wireless Technology Association has a memorandum of understanding with MCPC to promote each other's work. We've worked together jointly as two organizations for many years. The MCPC has three areas of work, including promotion and education, 
uh, technical guidelines and specifications in human resources development, including certification of wireless engineers, which they do in collaboration with the IEEE of the United States. I'd like to welcome here today uh, Mr. Masahiro Hadaguchi of MCPC, who is the Secretary General, and thank you for joining us today. <laughs> So at this time, we're actually slightly ahead of schedule, which is good because we may well fall behind later on, so we may need the extra minutes. Um, but I'm ready to now turn it over to one of the most innovative cellular operators in the world. Um, this company um, was one of the first to have its customers use wireless data on a mass market scale, and that is NTT Docomo. And I'm pleased to welcome today Mr. Seizo Anoe, who is the CTO and Executive Vice President of NTT Docomo. So, uh, welcome. <laughs> um, yes, after the presentation, depending on where we are in the schedule, uh, Mr. Seizo Anoe will also be able to take questions. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Seizo Onoe from NTT Docomo Japan. Uh, it's an honor to me uh, to be here as a keynote speaker today. Uh, actually, the, uh, recently, I often travel to the U.S. Uh, last week, I was in California to discuss the technology in 2035 and beyond. So today, my talk today is about 5G technology in for 2020. Much easier than <laughs> that technology in 2035. So today, I very easy talk for me. Uh, I have uh, several topics today. Uh, before 5G, I write to give you some update on the LTE today. Uh, actually, the LTE is so successful, in, especially in US, Japan, and South Korea. Very different from the previous generation 3G wideband CDMA. Uh, actually, this slide shows the uh, number of wideband CDMA operators. Uh, after the launch of Dogmo's launch, the only a few operators followed Dogmo. That was not so good. In kind of miserable situation for Dogmo. But very different for LT like this. A very quick deployment to the in the world. Very different. And also the for 3G, WCDM, Docomo happened to be a runaway leader, but this time, Docomo's policy was to launch LT as one of the first group of operators. Then we did that. Very good situation for the Docomo. And very uh, good situation for the LT. For the uh, Docomo uh, device lineups from 2010, from uh, Two, two years ago, already the all 100 percent of uh, smartphone has a LTE implementation. And also this year, from summer models, we have uh, six models for Porte Voice over LTE, and uh, Voice over LTE will be a standard implementation for the devices. That, that is the status of the LTE today. And uh, this is a very interesting chart. Uh, I, I'm so sure I, I can disclose this to the videos, but probably some inside the document complain <laughs> some <laughs> problem. But, but I, I can show you this. Uh, this shows the, the total data track volume. In total, total increasing still now, like this. But look at the the difference between LT data and 3G data. Uh, 
actually already two years ago, 3G traffic started to decrease. And uh, today, most traffic volume uh, was created, is created from through the LT, that's the status for today's Docomo's network. And uh, then the, we can shift the resources from 3G to LTE dramatically, like this, for the spectrum usage. Uh, today, Docomo is operating four bands for LTE. And uh, we originally, we, Docomo started with the existing 3G spectrum, 2.1 gigahertz, with uh, 5 to 10 megahertz by, by 2. Uh, anyway, the, we are expanding the band with this bands and band with this in accordance with the penetration of the LT devices like this. And uh, we, in the future, near future, we, we add this uh, new spectrum for APT 700 and uh, 3.5 gigahertz. Actually, the, yesterday, uh, our uh, regulator, MIC, uh, announced some result of the application of the uh, 3.5 kilohertz, uh, three operator applied. Then I'm sure that the, we can deploy the 3.5 kilohertz LTE in 2016. We have to do that. that, that that's the status of the LTE today. The next, uh, for the 5G discussion, I like to review the history of the uh, mobile uh, communication generation. I, find, I found a very interesting chart from GSMA Intelligence. Uh, then for the last week's presentation, I added some additional, another decade for 2030, but today, not, you ignore that right, right part, just, just to see our uh, left side. Uh, original charts uh, say that uh, every 10 years, uh, new generation technology emerge. And it comes to the peak 20 years later, 20 years after the launch. But this is just for the worldwide average. Actually, the, I feel something different because we are now in Japan, 20 years later, what happened? We shut down, we shut down the 1G and 2G. Already, no second generation system in Japan now. Very different, very different market. Peak, shut down. Peak, shut, shut down. Very different. Uh, I would say that he, uh, the, if I can say the, that Japan, US, and Korea is an advanced market, advanced market should lead the technology. Then the, the technology will deploy, penetrate to the world, worldwide scale. That, that's the general things for generation, uh, new generation technologies. Here I, last night I added one slide to, to say more clearly. A uh, very complicated chat. Probably you cannot understand this, what we said. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, this uh, chart shows the uh, population penetration rate for each generation for several markets. For example, the, uh, look at the black lines for North American market. Black line. Please look at the black line. Uh, this is originally from the, the, this one. This, this shows the uh, subscriber migration from 1G to 2G to 3G to LT. Black line. Jap Japan case, like this. But anyway, I would like to say that uh, uh, North America, uh, mainly by the US, uh, 1G, analog system is uh, described in the, this dotted, dotted line. Uh, very, very small part, but very different from others. Very successful, relatively successful in, uh, for analog 1G system in US. However, 
that successful result come to the, uh, for the <laughs> something different to the later generation. For second generation, this solid line, uh, US slow, slow, but this time for LT, very good, very quick, quick deployment. For Europe, uh, second generation GSM was so successful. Then 3G slow, LT, I would say that a bit miserable situation. <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess. I don't, please cut, cut this part to, to yours. Here, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, but uh, interesting is that Japan, Korea, always quick. Uh, here, I would like to say that the next time for 5G might be uh, Europe, because quick, slow, slow, quick. But I hope that the, uh, please, uh, US market, uh, together with the Japan, to lead the 5G technology. That, that's my hope here. I, I may say different thing to the European market. <laughs> to, today I'm saying, the, well, let's work together. That's a st uh, statement from me. And. Uh, Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Difficult to. Okay, and um, I describe the history different way with the chronological table. Each line indicate the uh, dec uh, decade for each generation. Uh, so here I write to. I can say that. Uh, uh, just after the launch of the previous generation technology, uh, there was a <coughs> technology for next generation. Then, now what for 5G? Then I, I like to uh, discuss the technology itself later, but here I I like to I like to discuss just the terminology of words 4G, 5G. Uh, this is also very different. Today, 5G, everyone likes five, terminology 5G, saying 5G, 5G, 5G. But 10 years ago, very different. Uh, then, going back to the 10 years ago, uh, you may not know the Docomo, is, Docomo contributed a lot for LTE. Uh, actually, what, what happened in, in Docomo 10 years ago? Yes, at that time, Dokum has already some, achieved some uh, 4G research outcome, result. We succeed in the 500 megabps data transmission in, in the field, in, in the outdoor experiment in 2000, 2003, and 1 gigabps data transmission in 2004. At this time point, we achieve that, that outcome. However, if look at the 3G business, as I sh showed in the first, with the first slide, uh, the worldwide deployment was very slow. Uh, also, the uh, subscriber, 3G subscriber, has a, only a limited number of the subscribers, and uh, very, uh, this is also a kind of miserable situation. Then the, even if we have a technology, 4G technology, we thought that it never come to the market. So uh, at that time, we learned that the uh, smooth path to the next generation was essential. So we, at that time, we proposed a super 3G concept. Probably everyone don't know, <laughs> doesn't know. But, but uh, we, 10 years ago, uh, yeah, yeah, actually 10 years ago, uh, we proposed uh, that concept, just simple, simply, the not, not talk about 4G. To, to go to the 4G, first evolve 3G, then build 4G on top. That, that's the basic concept. Then that evolved 3G, we call it uh, super 3G. But <coughs> at that time, uh, people 
general people were not so interested in terminology 4G. Rather than the not being interested in, they didn't like terminology 4G because they invested in, they are investing a lot to 3G without any return at that time. So there must not be a superior technology than to 3G. Then the, the, uh, everyone didn't like 4G at that time. So we didn't say the uh, 4G, but super 3G. That's a concept. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, next two slides. Uh, just I'm probably you may think I'm just boasting. Yes, I'm boasting. <laughs> uh, uh, this slide. Uh, this slide is not so. Originally, this slide was confidential because we used. I use this for uh, bilateral meetings with vendors and operators uh, to propose in initiating the standardization for LT standardization. Yeah, what, what is uh, boasting? <laughs> I'm proud of this child. Is that uh, we I made this slide in early 2004, but this. Uh, describe the what would hap happen next next six years. Then that happened definitely that exact timing. I was predictor, precise predictor. <laughs> <laughs> just, just I'm posting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, uh, yeah. This slide is actual 3GPP document contribute to. I contributed to uh, 3GPP by DOCOM and 25 co-sources companies. Uh, as you can see, the, there are no terminology, no words, LTE, 4G. Uh, just the, we described a 3G long-term evolution, this long-term evolution, just as a general word, not, not, not specific name. But finally, this come to, came to the LTE. That's that the status. Then back to the future today. <laughs> um, anyway, the, very different for the 4G station and 5G today. Uh, up to 4G, there was a, a technology representing that generation. For example, the 2G TDMA, 3G, CDMA or double CDMA, 4G, OFDMA, 5G, nothing today. Uh, that's the situation. 5G, nothing, no technology today, but terminology very useful. Everyone calls it 5G, 5G, 5G. But 10, years, 10 years ago, technology was there, but no one used 4G. Very, di <laughs> very different. Very interesting. But here, I, I my intention is to give you a negative message. Last week I may give a negative message. People think so, so. but just I'm, I'm saying that no sing, single representative technology. But there are some uh, several candidate technologies there. And also I like to emphasize that the combination of the technologies will create a new technology or new solution. That, that I wanted to say. Uh, I write to uh, some example and the real, uh, my, my ambition and dream later, later stage. And then the, uh, okay, next I just uh, talk about the global trend on 5G activities. Uh, yes, uh, 5G, everyone likes uh, terminology 5G today from last year. Uh, actually, the, uh, some uh, yeah, global international organization uh, discussed the 5G, ITR, NGMN, and GSMN, and also the some uh, government level, the, some uh, discussion on 5G, China, Korea, and Japan. 
and in Europe, the 5G PPP was established. And I felt something happening in US. Uh, US also trying to do something, right? I don't know. Uh, and also the some uh, uh, different area of the academia also have some uh, special event for 5G. Um, and recent topics in Japan, and this one, this one, uh, in Japan, five, the fifth generation mobile communication promotion forum was established this, this month, this month, yes, <laughs> this, this month, yes. And uh, this is one topic for the Japanese, Japan status. And here, okay, this one. Uh, today, uh, WT workshop with MCPs and Georgetown University. Uh, this is one of the activity for 5G. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, okay, next I try to discuss the uh, 5G requirements and scenarios. Uh, just one slide for requirements. As you know, the today still uh, discussion phase for requirements, 5G requirements still now, not, not defined yet, but probably already every, everyone says a similar thing, thing. So I can say that this will be a common requirement to the end. Uh, there are described five, five elements here. Uh, higher data rate, data rate and higher capacities. And capacity, this will be a common requirement to all generations so far, and from now on. And regarding latency, uh, this requirement was added in the, for the LTE. Uh, 3G was a very complicated system, so latency was some problem in, the, uh, in that system. But for LT, uh, latency was uh, recognized as a very important requirement, so actually a uh, low latency system was created for LT. For the 5G, uh, massive connections, massive device connections, and energy saving or um, super low power consumption is a very key requirement for to enhance, uh, enhance the um, coverage of the use cases, including the Internet of Things. For example, the, to accommodate the sensor systems, uh, very long battery life will be required. Not for like this, but, but uh, 10 years or more uh, battery life will be required. So, very different new requirement might be added for the 5G technology. That, that, that's the status of the today's discussions. Uh, next, I like to discuss uh, evolution scenarios, so, uh, evolution path to the next generation. This is very uh, controversial issue for every, every generation, for 3G case and LT case, some discussion. To get to uh, achieve a revolutionary solution or just a backward compatible uh, improvement, uh, enhancement, two scenarios. Uh, always some heated discussion between two camps. Uh, yes, a big game, big game. Uh, Revolutionary scenario may, people think that the revolutionary scenario may need a cost, investment, lots of investment. So there's some discussion or always uh, happen. Actually, again, going back to the, the past in the LTE cases, there were the two camps. Uh, very, very early stage of the LTE, LT standardization. Multi carrier HSPA could be a candidate of LTE. But finally, the, the new technology using the OFDMA LTE was created. 
but at the same time, the HSPA evolution was continued. Actually, we, I personally, I wanted to stop the HSP evolution. Personally, I asked my team, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't do that. <laughs> then finally, eight carrier HSPA specification was developed. Who used this? I think that's a very stupid situation, <laughs> I would say. But some people, some company supported, so 3GPP created such eight carrier HSPA. Very stupid. But my, my suggestion, my suggestion is if we have a new good technology, we we should stop the old technologies evolution. That that's a, a tips to change the new technology quickly. Then again going back to the going back to the future of the today, uh, 5G. Yes, in that sense, if we have a potential new technology for 5G, we I eager to get that. But problem is, as I said before the today, we have no single technology for 5G. So that's a challenge for today for, for 5G. Uh, yeah, but here, uh, we have already some uh, potential technologies, uh, potential candidates, spare technologies. Also, the next I like to explain the, the combination of the technology will create a new technologies. Yes, uh, first one example is just for the, not 5G, but for the uh, LT Advanced. LT Advanced itself, the, LT Advanced itself is not very uh, continuous, continuous evolution from LT, LT and LT Advanced. But LT Advanced itself is a single technology, but uh, some set of the um, features. Uh, major features, two of such a feature is a carrier aggregation and small cells. I'm saying this story in many, of, in every time with such an opportunity. Here I would say carrier aggregation is not smart, so smart technology. No new idea. Just implement two receivers inside, in top. Nothing new. Just implementation. I call this brute force technology. Yeah, brute force technology. And also the small cells. Small cell. This this is very old technology because this is just a original basics for the cellular system. Not, nothing new. However, the combination of the carrier aggregation of small cells will create a new features. Very good. Actually, Docomo plan to deploy such, such an active that early next, next year as an advanced serum. We call it the advanced serum. Uh, like this. Carrier aggregation between micro cell and small cell. This is a very good feature we can provide, we can enjoy. Uh, today, I do not go into the details, uh, details of technology, but anyway, this is a very good example for the combination of the technology. We create a new technology. And also, the, this concept itself is very important for the 5G. I would like to explain um, next. Uh, but before that, I like to say, talk my dream and my ambition. Uh, people tend to believe that the following story. 5G provides extremely high performance in data speed and capacity. Then it needs broader spectra, bandwidth. Then it must be, we have to use the higher flexing spectra with 
Larger propagation losses result in the shorter coverage, limited coverage. Then, as a conclusion, people think, people think 5G is just a hot spot system or used complementary only. I don't like this story. No. Uh, we should pursue the uh, achieving the wide coverage as a cellular system evolution, even if we use, use the higher spectrum. Th that, that's my dream and ambition. Can we achieve this? Yes. <laughs> yes, with massive mime. Uh, however, massive mime itself as a single technology this is not just an increase in the number of antennas. Nothing new. This is also just an implementation, the brute force technology. And also some problem as a system. Uh, actually, the, you know, the, the similar things is uh, adaptive array systems. Ad, ad, adaptive array systems. Ad, uh, Dogmo try to uh, adaptive array system to the apply to the commercial networks, but failed. Just because of the, uh, we need a common channels. Common channels cannot apply the adaptive arrays. So we needed a special solution for the common channels. After the tracking the device, uh, we can reach to the device. But before before tracking. <coughs> or for common channels that we cannot reach to the, the device. That, that's a very uh, serious problem as a system. Technology itself is good, but, but uh, it cannot be applied to the, as a system, that, that problem. So here, if we apply the combination of the massive MIME and the macro small cell advanced serum, as I said before, uh, this creates a new feature, new technologies. Actually, in this case, uh, th this device can be reached with, from this side by narrowing the beam. However, before, before tracking, this device cannot reach from this, this side. Then here, if we have another side, macro cell side, we can control through the macro cell, then we can track tracking these devices. Such a system uh, solution will be provided. So uh, the combination of massive and macro small cell configuration will create a new feature. Then we can achieve this. Yes, and this is an uh, image for the applied for this uh, technology. Then I, I I'm asking my team to create a kilometer, kilometer reaches for, for this small, from small cells. Uh, this is a Tokyo metropolitan area in Shibuya, Shibuya area. Um, macro cell here, and small cell deployed like this. And by a, a fat pipe of the small, from small cell user data uh, transmit to, to the device, and from macro cell, stable control and mi minimum user data can be conveyed over the macro cell. However, in Shibuya area, such a metropolitan area, uh, Tokomo case, uh, cell, cell radius of macro cell, just only a <coughs> few hundred meters. So this is very, very short, short, so not, not kilometers. So I ask my staff to create another, another uh, picture like this. This is uh, a picture from the uh, Dokomo's R&D center's roof, roof, roof top. Then here, if we have a, such a micro cell and small cell, we can achieve this. Almost, almost one kilometer uh, distance from this. And another different case in Germany case. This is, this is just, just an image, not a real deployment, but 
of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we can do such a uh, deployment. Even if you, uh, we use the higher frequency, we can achieve the, such a kilometer reach. That's my idea. Uh, anyway, uh, we have uh, today several candidate technologies for 5G and combination of the technologies we create a new technology for 5G. And next, some discussions related to the spectrum here uh, in technology wise. Uh, yes, uh, someone may believe that the 5G technology is just a technology for high frequency spectrum, millimeter wave technology is 5G. Partially, yes, but uh, we have, we have a frequency agnostic new technologies that can be applied to the 5G. So, uh, including those technologies, we should call the 5G, that, that, that's my image. Uh, 5G utilizes a wide range of frequency band with consi consistent design basis. That, that is a very ideal situation. I wanted to create such, such a schemes on the other, as, as a single technologies single technology. And also, the, uh, as I said before, for the combination of the different spectrum is also important for the new, new systems. So the existing frequency and new bands can have to be uh, tight, tight to interworking the, some new features. In that sense, we sh better to include four things as a 5G, not only for the high frequency spectrum technology is not a 5G. That, that, that's not all. We have a existing spectrum we have to utilize for 5G. That, that, that's uh, my idea. Then the spectrum. Uh, regarding a spectrum, I don't talk so much about the spectrum because this is a regulatory matter. Uh, but as a just fact, we may have some candidates for consideration of spectrum. Uh, above, above 24 gigahertz as well as below 24 gigahertz. Uh, actually in Japan, this um, um, round table conference on radio policy vision was uh, held, so uh, this is from s some such a uh, uh, document uh, basis to, to create this. As also, the, we may have some uh, candidate for consideration for the below 6 gigahertz as well. But I do, don't talk so much about this spectrum. I'm just not a regulator, but uh, just operator, just want spectrum. Just want, just want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but I, I, I leave this issue to the ne next, next session. Next session is the spectrum and po po policy. I, I leave this to Sugiwara. Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay. Uh, Yes, I'd like to show you some uh, research and development activities for Dokum case today. Yes, uh, again, the, just after the launch of LTE, we started uh, 5G or future radio access technology research. We have already some outcome for one is a 5G real time simulator. And we have uh, some result of the 10 gigabps field test, field experiments. Uh, this is the uh, first version of the 5G real-time simulator to simulate the uh, 
I said that uh, some massive mime and uh, combination of massive mime and uh, uh, advanced serum. And these five G cases. Luckily or fortunately, DOCOM got an award from MIC, <coughs> MIC, MIC Minister Award in a, an a exhibition event in Japan. We got this. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, MIC Minister Award. <coughs> Just saying this. Uh, this is uh, uh, last year uh, we got. Then we are now uh, upgrade, upgrading the simulator to apply the stadium, assuming the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics games, like this. Uh, we are now simulating the uh, difference between LTE and 5G, even for the uh, LT, right, something like this. And the, the result is shown here. But for, with the, yes, 5G, like this. Uh, then the comparison, comparison between two L, 5G and LT. Upper side, this uh, 5G, and the lower side, LT. We are now simulating the uh, transmission of the 4K, 4K video, even with using the LTE, uh, it doesn't work so well. So, but for 5G, very good performance. That, that type of result. And uh, another, another topic for the 5G activities, Docomo announced uh, our collaboration with vendors for 5G experiment in May. We announced this in May, now ongoing. Uh, we have some bilateral collaboration with multiple vendors, like this. Uh, this is not a one group activity. Uh, bilateral collaboration, we uh, uh, document is doing the, in parallel. Uh, by doing the, this uh, parallel activities, we Dokmo can cover the a wide range of the technologies and the spectrum. <coughs> now we are not doing. Uh, today I do not have any result or outcome to show here, but uh, in the future, in near future, some outcome there that we are announcing the result. Like this, we are now ongoing work on the 5G technologies like this. Okay, uh, on time. <laughs> conclusion. Uh, conclusion, what is 5G technology? Anyway, the definition of 5G or 5G technology, probably 5G definition never defined, I think. But here, uh, I'd like to say the common understanding, common image to have is important. So today I say that the no single techno technology representing 5G today. But some promising technologies are emerging, especially with a combination of technologies I show you today. And I, was, I say that the higher spectrum is just one of the enabler, not all, not everything. Uh, we have, we can utilize existing spectrum as well. And uh, I said the 5G utilizes wide range of frequency band with constant design basis that we should uh, pursue. And the second one, let's read 5G to the right direction. Uh, I said the advanced market, like uh, Japan, US, Korea, should lead the 5G technology to the right direction together with Japan and the US. And I didn't discuss so much about the spectrum, but I didn't discuss, but uh, one thing, uh, global common spectrum is important, very basic concept. Yeah, I don't say more than that. <laughs> 
And finally, my dreams and ambition. Let's tackle the challenge of achieving wide coverage, reach, long reaches to even if we use the higher spectra. Okay, last one is just my, my feeling, but I don't say that. Okay, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Uh, Richard Bennett with the American Enterprise Institute and High Tech Forum. Thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. If you were to summarize, would you say that the primary problem that 5G needs to solve is more efficient integration of macro cells and small cells? I, I can't is, is the primary problem you're trying to solve more efficient integration between macro and small cell? Yeah, I say that uh, this is just just uh, one of the uh, technologies. So, not not so in, not necessarily uh, just one initial program technologies. But uh, the value of having the control ch moving the control channel to the macro cell, while leaving the data channel in the small cell, uh, does that address the the mobility overhead that you get? by moving to a strictly small cell problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, 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 today I didn't go into the details of the technologies, but I, I yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, th this is not a, a primary problem, but uh, this creates very good new features. Uh, you, you mentioned that a small cell problem, small cell cells have several problems to so quick handovers. Mm -hmm. By using, adapting this uh, architecture, not, that's not a handover, just a carry aggregation, add, add, adding, detaching, adding, detaching. No signals to the core networks. So such a, uh, yes, uh, small cells, uh, there are some Problem in the small cell deployment, but uh, this architecture will resolve s such such issues. Yeah, yes. Um, Jennifer Fritchie with Wells Fargo. The demographic or the, the topology, topography rather, of the U.S. is obviously much different than Japan and the analogy has often been made that, you know, Japan is more the size of California versus the large masses of um, rural areas in the U.S. Do you think this technology could take, take effect as it has in Japan given the, the more difficult build out in the area? Sorry, I don't want to say. Oh, so saying the, the, the country size is much bigger in the U.S. So oh, does yeah, that yeah, change yeah. how you kind of design 5G? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Then I created this, this, uh, this results. Also, the, uh, in Japan, we have a rural area as well. Uh, this, this, uh, Rural enough, Yokosuka. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, we have a, su such areas. In, this in, in Japan, Japanese geographical. Then we can apply this one. So, in such, such case, uh, uh, I said that such a, uh, by using the massive MIME, the uh, long reach uh, massive MIME reach, we some helps, uh, some helps for the deployment scenario in the, such a rural areas. Then I show the uh, German case, the German case in Dresden. I, I, I don't know Dresden is, is how much, how, how rural, so I don't know, <laughs> but, but uh, it can be applied to this, this, such cases. We, of course, the 
uh, even in Japan, the metropolitan area is not only the problem, but also the how cost efficiently, cost uh, to deploy the cost efficiently is a key issue for the 5G as well. Bear Drive Ozzy and Wireless 2020. Um, I enjoyed your history lesson. And of course, if we don't learn from history, we repeat the same mistakes. So my question is, uh, when you describe the evolution of 3G versus the breakthrough technology that leads to big gain from 4G, uh, we're at the same moment here regarding 5G. And the only reference you made to a specific technology that might create such a breakthrough was NOMA. And you really didn't spend too much time describing how that would accomplish perhaps the dream you're describing where even in very high frequency bands you can achieve the coverage you're seeking. Is NOMA the equivalent of OFDMA for 5G? Uh. <laughs> you are talking about the different waveforms, waveform technology we apply to the 5G. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's some challenges. We are still some um, research on the waveforms. Actually, I showed, I showed some. Some challenges for waveforms uh, we are not uh, tackling. But today we have a concrete idea for diff totally different waveforms. So we have to continue such researches. But besides that, we have uh, another technology, so just a combination of technology. That, that's my statement today. Is that OK for you? So you're saying that any breakthrough in radio technology yeah, yeah. is still very experimental, still very much in the research phase? Research phase, and most people yeah. may abandon. <laughs> Actually, three, three years ago, we have, I was in such a panel, uh, many people uh, tackling the challenges, but no new idea at that time. Then we, my, uh, my answer was no, no new waveforms, just an architectural evolution will be a 5G technology. But I know the, originally I was a radio engineer, so I know these researchers have some frustration of the saturation of the technologies. That, that's today's status. But probably, uh, Many researchers trying to tackle still now. But today, I have no concrete idea for the, such a revolutionary change in the, such a basic part. Is that OK for you? Yeah. Mike? Uh, question in the back there. Uh, so there's not much clear. Uh, Andy Clegg from Google. There's not much clear spectrum left, especially below 20 gigahertz or so. Does your vision for 5G technology development include development of new techniques for 5G systems to be able to share spectrum with other incumbent systems? Is that part of the development path for 5G? Uh, yes, yes. But uh, I. Originally, if we can avoid a shared usage, I, I want to avoid such a situation. Concrete allocation is a, we, we need no unnecessary, does not need unnecessary cost, but a shared system. Uh, but if shared system, share, sharing, uh, the, uh, already some system deployed, so to share that system. Uh, that will be a new challenge and uh, included in the next generation. But I think that can, we should 
apply such a case not only for 5G, but also the today's technology have to uh, accommodate such, such a cases. One more question, and then it'll be time for a break. Uh, I'm Terry Moore from MCCI. Um, you know, uh, looking at your historical charts, I was struck by the fact that you had uh, the 10 to 20 year generation time, and all of that history correlated with Moore's law in semiconductor manufacturing, giving a factor of 100 every decade both in the raw power available to the designers and a substantial reduction in cost per transistor at the same time that you're getting more capacity. Moore's law is at an end. In the next 20 years, you will not see the same level of growth. Uh, you may see the level of growth in transistors, but the cost per transistor at the current technology nodes already is starting to increase. How do you think that will affect the goals and the feasibility of deploying 5G on the same uh, uh, speed that you saw with 4G and 3G? Mm, I, I, I don't fully really understand to you what you say, but, but the, probably the uh, device technologies improvement may create some new technology in the, in that are history from now, from up to now. What was happening in the future? Is that your question? In the, in the past, we've had very predictable technology improvements and very predictable economics, very predictable cost reduction uh, for the technology. Mm. It appears that the cost is not going to continue to go down. Yeah. How will that affect the design of the, the end product, the, the nodes, the, the, the user equipment, where in order to support 5G, you may need uh, additional processing power. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, yes. Do you think this is going to slow down the adoption of 5G? So, yeah, yeah. That always happens. If we, when we introduce LT, that Device cost up, but we the, after the widely spread the mass production the reduced. So we have to uh, go into the such a situation. So first we have to start. Uh, we should uh, th that always uh, happened in, in the past. Uh, we have to repeat such things. Of course, the some uh, technologies. Uh, technology itself to how to reduce the processing power. That, that's the one key uh, theme for the research. Is actually, the, uh, in the past, uh, equalizers, uh, no one I think thought that the, uh, we can achieve the, uh, such a complicated processing in such small devices. But today, we can do that. So in the future, such a technologies create a, a re reduction of the uh, device costs, but still we we want to add some new processing. So probably uh, a little bit price uh, cost add addition we need it. Okay. Thank you very much. of the entire audience that that was an extremely informative presentation.